this microphone is working. Sounds like it is. Good day, everyone. Nice to be with you again. Looking, gathering around the Word, looking into the Word, and experiencing uh, another chapter in Job's life. We've chosen for an opening scripture today, uh, Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 to 7. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will bless and I will be his God, and he shall be my son, all his, ch all his children. Heavenly Father, we thank you for every uh, word that you uh, have brought things forth by your word, and every word of yours to us. We thank you uh, for th this, this evening, this gathering together, Lord, and uh, we just pray for the moving of your spirit in our midst, that we might know and experience your mind and your heart on a daily basis. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, another little reading from our little book, Faith Is. Faith is delighting in the fact that though I am a vessel marred, unsightly, broken even, I am filled by God's own hand with Christ, his treasure. Faith is trusting in God. Faith is doing his, pardon me, faith is trusting that God is doing his work in me when I feel inwardly cold, hollow, lifeless, deserted, and I long for reassuring feeling. Faith is walking before God, not before my friends. Faith is letting go of my demands that someone else change. No, I need to read that differently, sorry. Faith is letting go of my demands that someone else change and looking to God for the changes he sees I need. And I read these things, bring these things to you because they're common to us, the brokenness and everything else. And this is exactly where we find Job in this chapter of his life, not just the Bible. So join me, if you will, in Job chapter 7, verses, reading verses 11 to 21. Job 7, 11 to 21. And it's Job speaking, and he says, Therefore I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I a sea or a sea serpent that you set a guard over me? When I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions, so that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my body. I loathe my life. I would not live. Let me alone, for my days are but a breath. What is man that you should exalt him, that you should set your heart on him, that you should visit him every morning and test him every moment? How long? Will you not look away from me? And let me alone till I swallow my spit. Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? 
Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust, and you will seek me diligently, but I will no longer be. Job can contain himself no longer, and he simply expresses this to God. These are his feelings. This is his moment. We are going to look at a few verses in which Job is expressing his grief and frustration some more. And as I read them, I want you to ignore what Job is saying so that you can, so that you can hear what he's trying to express. Ignore what he's saying so you can hear what he's trying to express. A, a good um, technique in, in counseling and listening is this very thing. So we will hear this hurting man stagger right to the edge of blasphemy. Job has already cursed the day he was born, and now he goes on. Job 7, verse 19, How long will you not look away from me and let me alone till I swallow my spit? Job chapter 10, verses 20 and 21. This is horrible, isn't it? It's not, not nice to listen to. This is life, and we need to listen to it. Are you are not my days few? Cease, leave me alone, that I may take a little comfort before I go to the place from which I shall not return, to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. Job chapter 14, 18 and 19. But as a mountain falls and crumbles away, and as a rock is moved from its place, as water wears away stones, and the torrents wash away the soil of the earth, so you destroy the hope of man. This is Job talking to God. I don't know if you ever talked to God like this. I want to encourage you, it's not a sin. It's grief. And he's not afraid of it. Job chapter 16, verse 9. He tears me in his wrath and hates me. He gnashes at me with his teeth. My adversary sharpens his gaze on me. Wow. I told you, right to the edge of blasphemy. Job 19, verse 7. If I cry out concerning wrong, I'm not heard. If I cry aloud, there's no justice. Wow. Chapter 30. Verses 20 and 21. I cry out to you, but you do not answer me. I stand up and you regard me, but you have become cruel to me. With the strength of your hand, you oppose me. Verses 26 and 27 of that same chapter. But when I looked for good, evil came to me. And when I waited for light, then came darkness. My heart is in turmoil and cannot rest. Days of affliction confront me. I remember one of my own trials went on for what I would consider far too long. And my expression after a number of months was, every time there was a light at the end of the tunnel, it just turned out to be another train. As a matter of fact, I wrote a sermon and preached it on Thetis Island years ago, and you know, the you know what the title of it was? The title was Hope in Tunnel 37. And what I came to was that I keep looking for things in this earth to change, to be different. Maybe we're doing that now with COVID. That's not where our hope lies. Our hope lies in God. No matter what, hard grief will take us to this place. As C.S. Lewis said in his journal of grief after his wife's death, it's called A Grief Observed. And he says this, not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not that so there is no God after all, but so this is what God is really like. Is God a sadist? asked Lewis, echoing Job's doubts. These things are common. Sticking her head in the sand, pretending everything is all right, putting on a good face, serves no purpose at all. Except to just cover up so that people can't see that we're actually as broken as they are. But we all are. Job is losing something at this point in the trial. He's losing his grip 
on who he thought God was, and he's pretty much lost his grip on who he thought he was as well, <laughs> so that everybody's lost. Oh, what's the point of that? Hang on, this is not the end of the story, just the middle of it. God never changes, but quite often when people are willing, he will help them change. He will help them change when they're willing. First Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13. well-known chapter, verses 11 and 12. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror, I would, like, I would liken that to a, a dirty glass, <laughs> dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Wow. I'm, I'm waiting for that day. <laughs> Brokenness clouds our vision, distorts our, distorts our perception, and spoils the view. That's what it does in our lives. People in the midst of a trial are easier for God to help than people who pretend that everything is okay. I, I, I just had a, <laughs> an appointment with a doctor, it was a phone call, you know, and so the, the doctor's asking me, is, you know, how are you doing, is everything okay? And I'm saying, yeah, yeah, I'm getting along, I'm doing. I hesitated to tell some of the gory little details of some of the daily struggles because then she'd find out something was wrong. Not really wrong, but just, sufferings of life that we all kind of, kind of deal with. And, and so, if we pretend before the physician that everything is fine, then nothing's going to get fixed. Just the way it is. And God is our great physician. People who are in denial about their grief or their spiritual depravity only have themselves for comfort. I don't know about you, but in my case, how useless is that? When I need help, I... I need help. I can't, if I can't help myself, I need help from somebody else, from God. I've already mentioned that Job and his friends were a lot alike in this book, in that they have the same theology. But now, there begins to be a difference. The trial is making the difference. At this point, Job is still an honest man. I have not done anything wrong. He hasn't changed that part of his confession. Of his confession. And his friends, though, though they were being expo exposed as merely, excuse me, Job at this point is still an honest man. His friends, though, are being exposed as merely religious ones. And without faith, hope, and love, from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, religion is brutal, absolutely brutal. And that's where they were coming from. And that's why their comfort was not very comforting. Back to the book of Job. Chapter 8. Build out the shoe height. The joke is he was the shortest guy in the Bible. It's a bad joke. Continue to watch for truth and error as we go along in this story of Job. If we can't spot it here in Job's friends, we won't be able to spot it very well in our own lives either. And that's where we need to be able to spot it because we are both saved and being saved and will be saved. So we're being conformed to his, being conformed to his image and we're being transformed daily. So at any given point, we've got some inconsistencies. But if we, and if we can't spot them, if we just cover them over, how is God going to be a part of our lives? in making things different. He won't be. We need to be honest before him. Bildad answers Job, but we can see from chapter 7 that Job was not speaking to Bildad, he was speaking to God. But Bildad answered anyway. It's rude to interrupt someone, and especially uh, when they're speaking to God, and it's totally unnecessary. 
Well, unless we think <clears throat> God actually really needs us because he being complete without us. Hmm. Check your biographies for Bildad's profile. I believe there'll be one on, on the screen for you in the middle of these, uh, the middle of the sermon as it's processed. To put it in a nutshell, he believed that those who have gone before us have figured God out, and all we have to do is use that knowledge. And you'll see this expressed, his convictions, convictions expressed in chapter 8, verses 8 to 9, and in chapter 18, verses 5 to 21. That's Bildad the Shuhite. This attitude of Bildad's, by the way, can lead a person to what I like to call lazy beliefism. I, I believe in God. Really? How come it doesn't look like it? <laughs> because they were living a lie. We need to be careful of his learned attitude and we just need to apply it without thinking, without praying. It can lead to lazy beliefism. And that is what they, uh, that is, what they believe is not much use in the daily grind of life. It's like having faith without works, or faith that doesn't work, or faith that isn't working, because you're not using that. What they believe may be nice to listen to, but it lacks practicality in daily living, living and interaction with God. Interaction with God is faith that's alive. So Bildad struts onto the scene, tells Job and his children, tells Job that his children must have sinned, and so that is why God destroyed them. Wow. Talk about calling the empire blind from the bleachers. My goodness. And then, and then he goes on to say that there must be secret sin in his own life because of the things that have happened to him. Maybe you too have believed such lies about yourself or others. Adversity brings up all kinds of, it reveals really the heart of man, adversity. Although there is sin in the world and a good many, and in a good many lives, but God is a God of mercy before he is a God of judgment. To paraphrase Charles Price, in his book uh, about Joshua, he says, if we will serve God on his terms, he is our friend. If we only insist on serving him on our terms, he is our judge. That's to be on God's terms. Doesn't matter if it makes sense. God created the world and keeps the world and works in people's lives. Because we don't understand, it's not God's fault. Bildad's principles were intact, but his application of them was all wrong in this situation. Basically, he had it backwards. He was proceeding like he was in charge of God and not that, like God was in charge of him. Probably, I guess, because he wasn't. Bildad was very honest and very convicted about what he believed, and yet what he believed caused him to walk and behave in such a manner that he was serving God on his own terms. Not really serving God at all. There are cases in the Bible where people have perished because of their uh, iniquity. Acts 5 verses 1 to 10, Psalm 1 verses 4 to 6, Deuteronomy 28 15 to 68. Although Bildad could have been right on the basis of principle, he was wrong in this situation. Well, it says in the manual you just have to do this and then that should work that way. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Seriously, there's no thinking going on there. There's no really connecting with God in the situation. It's all mechanical. Um, so in all fairness, we must admit that Bildad had a good deal 
of knowledge about God. Now, let's research that a little further. The Apostle Paul makes this statement to the Corinthian church in regards to knowledge and love. And he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies or builds up. And so if we're just full of knowledge, <laughs> we won't be able to help up or build up anybody because we're just busy hammering principles at them. And there's no real interaction or God's presence in all of that. So we're not... <laughs> I think eventually our minds do recover from a sinful life, but God doesn't save the mind. He saves the heart, which affects the mind. What Paul was saying to the Corinthians was that they had a lot of knowledge, and, and this was not a healthy church. This was a carnal church, lots of fighting, lots of look at me, look at me. And so uh, he says that they had a lot of knowledge about God in their lives, but because they lacked love, all their knowledge only served to paralyze them within the confines of their own understanding. Navel-gazing. Religious navel-gazing. Bill, Bill Dad had set himself up as Job's judge instead of leaving that with God. We need to be careful that we don't end up just serving Christian principles based on our vast knowledge of the Holy One. It goes deeper than that. We serve the living God. And God does not serve us or our ends through His principles. If you find yourself telling God what it says in His Word, you need to back up about 15 miles because you missed the turn. You're on the wrong road. Sometimes the reason people like to learn so much about God is not so they can yield their lives to Him. That would be wonderful. That's the facade they put on. It is so that they can look like they have yielded their lives to Him and still be in control. Religiously, of course. The amount of love that a person expresses is in direct proportion to how well they actually know God because God is love. God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Job's friends came to help, but they weren't very helpful. It seems more important to them to appear knowledgeable even at Job's expense. They have thrown their friend under the bus in order to look better as leaders in their community. They had to blame somebody and they weren't about to blame God, so they blamed Job. This is, this is a common, common practice in the world of politics. And I would dare say, if a church should become politically motivated, it will be common there as well. Because a man is striving to be in charge. Hosea chapter 12, verse 6 is the heart. 6 is the heart of God toward Israel. And so it was toward Job and his friends. And it simply says this, So you, by the help of your God, return, observe mercy and justice, and wait on your God continually. You must wait for God. Job chapter 9, Job's response to Bildad's advice. In verses 1 to 13, Job answers his friends. And he sounds an awful lot like God in chapter 38 and following. This says to me that Job has the seed of faith in his heart, as it were. And God was seeing to it that it grew by adding the fertilizer of adversity. Yes, I... Uh, lived in Chimanus for a while and there was a, a dairy farm just up the road from us and he had very healthy cattle and they give very good milk <laughs> and every year he would empty out the manure pits and spray it all over the fields, 400 acres. You could smell it for, <laughs> I'm sure Vancouver Island could smell it. Um, but it was good, it was successful, but wow, what a stink. And you might say, this stinks 
I don't need this, whatever you're going through. You don't know that. You don't know that. I, <laughs> you may need it. Verses 16 to 18 of Job chapter 9. If I called and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice. For he crushes me with a tempest and, mul and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not allow me to catch my breath, but he fills me, but fills me with bitterness. It was a storm that crushed his children under the weight of the house that they were feasting together in. It's a sore spot to Job. Of course it is. He looks, it looks to me like the pressure is so great that Job's theology is not going to survive. But Job is. But he won't be the same. He won't be the same. Verse 18, but he fills me with bitterness. Question, what is filling Job with bitterness? Is it God? Or is it his own disappointment with what he expected, what he, what he expected God should do for him? This is where the bitterness is coming from. Verse 28, chapter 9. I am afraid of, of, of all my sufferings. I know that you will not hold me innocent. Job is afraid that God won't hold him innocent. But at the end of the book, he's innocent. God points that out. Verses 32 and 35. <clears throat> For he is not a man, as I am, that I may answer him, and that we should go to court together, nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us. Let, pardon me, lay his hand on us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and do not let dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him, that is to be afraid to speak, but it is not. It's not so with me. Hebrews 14, or pardon me, verse, <coughs> chapter 4, verse 16 says, Come boldly, therefore, before the grace of God. And Job is saying in verse 33 that there should be a mediator. He's also suggesting that, that, uh, not, that there should be, he's suggesting Pardon me, he's not just complaining that there's not a mediator, he's suggesting also that there could be one. And Jesus himself has laid his hand on, on the Father and on us. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So you can see there how Job is on track and off track. He's crying out for what should be and what God knows is and will be. We'll just close with this next comment before we start chapter 10. C.S. Lewis said that when man begins to think, God has the advantage. Indeed, indeed. May the Lord continue to bless and keep you. Our benediction tonight is from the book of Jude. I'm sure you all know it well. Jude, verses 24 and 25. <clears throat> now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.